game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to the Rerooted Podcast with Francesca Maxime, trauma-sensitive mindfulness meditation teacher and poet. Together, we'll take a closer look at approaches to transforming trauma with insights from psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. Join Francesca and her guests for an exploration of our shared connection and how we can cultivate greater compassion for ourselves and for others. If you'd like to support Francesca and the Rerooted Podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Francesca. Hey everyone, I'm Francesca Maxime and welcome to this edition of the Rerooted Podcast here on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network. Uh, right now it is June 18th, one day before June 19th, 2020. We are in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic and I am coming to you from Lenape and Canarse land here in Brooklyn, New York. And I have someone uh, as a guest today that I'm truly honored to be speaking with today because what we're going to be talking about is something that is not often discussed when we talk about things like Black Lives Matter and race, um, but that it is whiteness itself. What is whiteness? What is white body supremacy? Where did this come from in terms of the history of this country? How does it live in people's psyches, movements, behaviors, actions? And um, what kind of research supports different ways of being and different possibilities um, that we can see? So my guest today is Dr. Janet E. Helms. She is the Augustus Long Professor in the Department of Counseling, Developmental, and Educational Psychology and Director of the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture at Boston College. She is the past president of the Society of Counseling Psychology. And uh, Dr. Helms is also a fellow in Division 17, uh, Division 45, and Division 35 of the uh, APA. She's also a member of the Association of Black Psychologists, the American Psychological Society, and the American Educational Research Association. She's written extensively about race uh, for lay people as well as for uh, clinicians. Uh, this is one of the books uh, that is more geared toward uh, the clinical population, Black and White Racial Identity Theory, Research, and Practice and a book that is now published under a new publisher, although I have a, an old copy um, that was actually published when I was in college, is A Race is a Nice Thing to Have, A Guide to Being a White Person or Understanding the White Persons in Your Life. And um, I think this pocket guide, if you will, is essential reading um, for all white-bodied people uh, today, now more than ever, perhaps. Dr. Helms, welcome to Rebooted. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Francesca. Thanks for inviting me. It, it, it's really an honor and a pleasure. And I just want to sort of name that you are um, truly an expert in field on this uh, subject that we're talking about, which is whiteness, and have been uh, spending decades researching and, and practicing ways in which to help educate folks uh, about what exactly we, we are talking about here uh, when it comes to whiteness. So perhaps that might be a good place to start. Uh, if we're talking about increasing better race relations, being brothers and sisters to one another, having our liberation and our freedom be intertwined and interbound, why is interrogating whiteness um, perhaps a good place to start? Well, I think it's a good place to start because we don't recognize the extent to which whiteness perpetuates racism in the society. And so I like to start from the beginning, which, uh, which is the Constitution in the United States. Um, the Constitution actually protects white heterosexual male privilege, which I call wimpdom. Mm. Now, what that means then is systemic racism has to do with protecting that privilege. So all of the rules, policies, social practices are essentially designed to protect white male heterosexual privilege. Um, 
white women benefit from that, but they don't own it. And so what we have in history is a sequence of different groups threatening that privilege in one way or another, and uh, white men either deciding to give a little marginal room there if it benefits them or fighting against the threats to privilege. So when we talk about systemic racism in our society, we actually talk about it like we don't know where it comes from. It just came out of the air or something. And the reason we don't talk about it is because it's always a threat to whiteness. It's always a threat to the people who have privilege from from birth and the people who don't have privilege. Uh, whenever we change a rule about uh, systemic racism in the society, we threaten someone who's white. And so I think it's really important for us to begin to think about what is the threat because if we can understand why white people feel threatened, then we can maybe help them understand how they can change themselves in ways so that they're not always afraid of losing something. Yeah, I, I so appreciate that. Um, not always afraid of losing something. What is that something? It, it may be different depending on where the white person is in their context. But the general something is the, the unacknowledged privilege. If you are a white person and you have to recognize that you are treated differently than all other people, then that begins to say to you that maybe you have some responsibility for changing. Uh, that might not be so comfortable. Do you give up uh, your um, whatever your context is, but do you give up, for instance, being able to go into a police station and know that you'll probably come out alive? Uh, if you begin to question that, then you put yourself at risk. Putting yourself at risk then means that you're giving up that, that safety privilege. So there are different privileges and each white person has to begin to ask themselves, what is the privilege in my life and how do I have to change myself in order to share privilege as opposed to thinking it all belongs to uh, the white people in one's context. Got it. Right. Shared privilege, meaning that, um, you know, we all can have access and equity and, 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 and be able to move about more freely. Um, what would, exactly. Yes. What would we, what would, what would prevent a white person from uh, doing that? What are the ways in which people do not choose to lean in? Well, white people don't actually have any role models for being uh, good equalitarian uh, white people. Um, when I uh, do consultations with uh, groups who are interested in anti-racism work, I would often ask white people, what is your race? And they would say, I'm a mongrel. I'm mixed. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know, but they would they would never say that they were white. And I find it put together. The reason they don't say that they are white is because the only people who are allowed to acknowledge their whiteness in our society are white nationalist people, and mm. no one wants to be one of those. And in fact, the name of my book came from the fact that I wanted white people to know that there is a good way to be a white person. So a race is a nice thing to have. It's not something that you have to hide or pretend doesn't, doesn't exist. So in my, um, my white racial identity work, I've come up with the conceptualization of different ways that white people deal with their whiteness. They're essentially born into a society that's both what I call contact, which is obliviousness to their race, and reintegration, which is trying to protect one's racial privilege all the time. And so be, being able to begin to recognize the ways in which you express and save racism in the society, I think helps white people to begin to overcome the ways in which they're socialized. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or do you want me to talk some more about that? Well, um, I'd love for you to talk more about it, actually, because I think that that contact stage is, um, is of course, the portal to the beginning of change. It is. Uh, the contact stage is essentially where people or white people are born. They don't see race. Uh, they feel like um, they don't see it. They don't think it has any implications. They know which box to check 
but they don't understand that when they check that box, they are actually making a political statement about who they are and essentially what it is that they believe. So as they begin to enter, usually it's an interaction either with people of color or an interaction with the moral dilemmas of our society. So I think our time that we're in now is particularly interesting because many white people are becoming aware of a a moral dilemma. And the moral dilemma is that police treat black people and Latinx people and indigenous people differently than they treat white people. And so we were born, we think, into a country that says all people are created created equally. But what if you are a white person and now you recognize this dilemma that some people are and some people are not treated in the same ways? I think that begins to shake the obliviousness, the lack of awareness the not knowing that racism impacts you and that you you are a member of the uh, group that's benefiting from racism. So when that happens, people are really confused. And in some ways, I think we're seeing now some confusion, um, which I call disintegration. I think confusion is really good mm. because where there is confusion, there is the opportunity for growth. If you don't if you don't scare yourself, then that growth can move in a forward direction. If you do scare yourself, then that growth might be move backwards and you hide. You pretend that you don't see what you really see. And is that what maybe would be freezing or shame or shutdown or something? I, I think when people are confused, that's what they're feeling. They're feeling shame, they're feeling uh, blame. Uh, they're feeling like um, they don't understand why they're being blamed for something that they don't think they did because racism is so nebulous, they have a difficult uh, time handling it. They can only conceptualize it from the perspective of the other. They can't conceptualize it from the perspective of the white person and how the white person is benefiting. And so what I want people to begin to think about what I want, especially white people to begin to think about is what in this situation are you really responsible for? What in this situation can you really do something to change? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So Dr. Helms, yes, this idea of, you know, sort of interrogating whiteness and this disintegration phrase of confusion, I think is is so critical. Um, and maybe I misspoke earlier when I was saying contact is the first stage, but I guess what I'm saying is naming it, just naming that there are stages here that, that you know, we sort of come to in terms of... Um, from a from a Buddhist mindfulness standpoint, which is sort of the frame of, of of the network that this podcast airs on, you know, sort of would be called stages of awakening or stages of enlightenment or stages of um, understanding. Um, that that this disintegration phase is sort of um, like doubt or or like this phase of confusion, where you're disintegrating into this sense of I'm not really sure where I am or where I was. And part of that, I think, is because whiteness, as you say, has not been defined as a race itself. It's been defined in deficit and that people who are um, white-bodied have had to assimilate based on uh, the way in which American culture set up uh, people to come here, meaning that they would have to give up uh, a lot of their culture uh, in order to be here. So being Italian, for example, as I was mentioning to you off camera before we started, we couldn't practice our Italian at home. We had to give that up. And so we became white when we were no longer ethnically oriented. So can you talk a little bit about whiteness as a deficit and how that leads to um, this sort of sense of not maybe feeling proud to be white or feeling like you have a white racial identity? Um. I'm not sure that I would think about whiteness as a deficit, particularly. Um, I think about, well, white people, white men define who has a race. And so Italians weren't originally white. They had to earn their whiteness by giving up cultural aspects of themselves. Every group, every white group, white ethnic group has to earn its privilege in the society by giving up uh, aspects of themselves. And so 
What I say to people is that you have to begin to think about the origins of where whiteness as privilege originated in our society. It's mostly a Northern and Western European principle. So everyone who didn't fit into that, who was white or who became white, had to give up something. And one way of beginning to question whiteness is by, by beginning to ask, what did your people, what did your ancestors have to give up in order to earn white privilege? Because that's that's what essentially is about. Um, you can't think about, some people think about whiteness as the absence of color, where clearly whiteness is not the absence of color when we're talking about how people are classified. Uh, whiteness is strictly about who has access to privilege and who does not. Even if you look at yourself and you say, well, I don't have any money. If you're white, you still have privilege because relative to the person who's a person of color who does not have privilege, you have privilege. So it's about situating yourself in context and thinking about what that means in terms of your access to privilege, how you earn it, how you maintain it, and the threats to it. For example, if um, you, Francesca, decide one day that you're going to be a revolutionary uh, for Italians and you're not going to accept whatever it is that you had to give up in order to earn privilege, you're going to retrieve your Italian ethnicity. You have to re recognize that that might mean that you'll lose privilege because you paid a price in order to get it. So every white person has to ask what it is that they will give up in order to be if you will, moral human beings. Mm, moral human beings that you're at being asked to give up your ethnicity or culture, part of your deep constitution in order to become quote unquote moral human beings as determined by, as you say, white men. Can you say more about that? I, actually, I do that in the reverse. You were asked to give up your right to be moral human beings in order to have access to white privilege. Sorry, misunderstood. Right, exactly. So the the, the whole idea is that our whole um, our morality gets taken from us. Our whole sense of, of of being by having to assimilate to this system that only has one particular way that it deems to be correct. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Got it. Sorry about that, but I understand and I apologize. So this idea of being, um, because I just think it's so important that, you know, even in school, you know, even when we're learning things, you know, when we talk about race, what I meant by that in terms of the deficit, which is not at all what you mean, like I, I, I get that also in terms of my terminology, is that there's always conversation about black people, brown people, Asian people, Latinx people, but there's not a lot of conversation around whiteness, right? Because right. why? It's already assumed to be what is called this dominant culture. And I, I, I cringe when I use that word, but the one that we're supposed to be assimilating to by these, you know, inequitable, you know, power structures that, that, that be. Um, and that that part of it means that we're basically cutting off all these parts of ourselves from our history that we talked about. And that and that it's just sort of assumed like a fish in water that that whiteness is the culture um, that we should be in, even if we're not of that. And that if we're not of that, then there's something wrong or something like that. Is that right? Uh, two things. I actually like to differentiate between race and culture. Um, although uh, there are different kinds of racism. There's uh, institutional or systemic and there's cultural and so on. Um, so whiteness carries with it a culture, but whiteness also carries with it racism, which is a system of privilege and power. What, um, what we'll call for the moment, white ethnics gave up, give up in order to have access to power and privilege. They gave up their culture. So they gave up. They gave up what makes them special. What makes them uh, actually what uh, society needs. They gave up how they converse with each other. They gave up how they think about themselves. They gave up how they look in order to have ex access to power and privilege. So power and privilege is associated with racism. Culture doesn't have to be. But right now it is because we all think we have to conform to white culture. 
Okay. If you begin to reclaim your cultures, then what that means is that you begin to shake the foundations of white privilege. You begin to say, well, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is being who you are as a person, being a moral person. So I don't want people to think that they have to give up their culture in order to become moral white people. In fact, it's the opposite. They have to reclaim their culture in order to become moral white people. I love that. Yes. The reclamation, the recovery of, of, of your original, um, of your original culture that, that, that is, uh, taken away, uh, in this process. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and it's funny, there is a, there is a class that I had taken called before we were white that's uh-huh. offered by an organization called whiteawake.org and um, very much takes us through that process and that journey. And there's a lot of self-interrogation work, but there's also a lot of education work around, uh, you know, these territories as being Turtle Island and the indigenous people who inhabited this and, you know, why the folks who, who left Europe even left. And it was about capitalism and about the elites and about like what you talked about power, power also is manifest not only through kidnapping and enslavement and genocide, but also power is manifested through um, equity building and wealth because of that land grab and extraction and, 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 and labor and, and, th- and, and human capital, quite frankly. So can we talk a little bit more about how that plays into it? So the reclaiming our roots is, is one piece as white people, but there's also this understanding of like what really happened in terms of the history of this country. Well, the history of the country, and in many senses, I would say the history of one's own group, because um, each of the immigrants as well as the indigenous peoples, have a history. And when you combine, if you know about each of those histories, then you know about the history of the United States. And so we have to begin to, the first place is to explore our our own history, to find out who we are or who we were. Uh, Many, when I've done work with um, uh, many white groups, many don't know that they're ancestors gave up things so that they could have access to power in the society. So I think it's really important to go back and claim what was given up. And as you claim your own sense of who you are, then you begin to understand why other people want to claim themselves as well. And so I think that's where we begin. We begin to deconstruct. We begin to think about ourselves first as people who I think, or actually born with a moral center that gets distorted. And then we began to explore how that happened. What, what in our society did we give up? What in our society are we protecting by giving up those things? And what are we willing to risk in order to reclaim ourselves? Right, right. And, 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 and I love that. And I hear you, you know, really saying that again and again, is that, um, in, in my personal opinion, I, f- I feel as though it's almost um, a, a mental, uh, like a, an emotional illness, a, a, a spiritual deficit. I think Ken Hardy talks about, Dr. Kenneth Hardy um, uses some word that is very similar to yours. I can't remember exactly the phrase that I heard him say recently, so that it's sort of a spiritual deficit or some spiritual sort of um, lacking or, or longing that is, 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 is sort of missing and that the invitation is there to kind of be reclaimed and re-entered into. Um, when, we, when we talk about this, we're talking about white people doing this work because in this system, in this society, in this structure of, of oppression that is whiteness, and with the wealth or with the equity, or as you say, the privilege that is afforded to people in white bodies and not given the access to people in brown and black bodies and indigenous bodies and Latinx bodies and Asian bodies in the same way, that it is incumbent on white people to do some of this work of investigating their roots and reclaiming their roots and um, understanding and refinding their own moral center, as you say, and you say that that comes partly from this disintegration phase in these summary, in these, you know, sort of stages of, of awakening, if you will. W- what comes next? What, what, what might be the next iteration? Well, um, confusion is not a happy place to be. 
And sometimes what people will do is that they will uh, revert back to just pretending that uh, racism, that immorality does not exist. Sometimes what they do is they develop um, what I call a reintegration way of looking at the world. They express their anger outwardly. They express their confusion outwardly. So now they engage in activities that look like uh, maybe ordinary racism, uh, recognizing that they've lost who they were, and now they're searching for someone to be. In our society, the you can be a racist, and there's actually no punishment for being racism, for being racist. Uh, some people might even say you're very ni- nice people because you're racist. So there's there's no there's no punishment. You can hold high office uh, and so forth. We're just now beginning to get rid of the symbols of uh, major racism in our society by way of the removal of the Confederate uh, flag and statues. So you can be rewarded in the society for being racist. Um, there, there's hope beyond reintegration. But to be honest with you, I actually don't know why why white people would give up all of that power. Uh, but in fact, they do. Uh, not all of them, but many of them do. They begin to question their own behavior. Um, my uh, An example I often use is a uh, person who was a grand dr- dragon in the KKK who essentially was uh, asked to... Uh, kill his child because his child had a disability and uh, uh, purity is a necessity if you're going to be a good uh, white KKK person. He didn't want to do that. He left his child and he began to question all of the things that he had done before in his past. And as he began to question those things, then he began to look for another more positive way of being. And as he did that, he began to develop some of the uh, other styles that I that I talk about as um, recovering from uh, internalized racism. So one of those I call pseudo independence. That's kind of an intellectual awareness of racism and a, be- a belief and understanding that one has to do something about uh, racism. Most of our affirmative action programs come out of this pseudo independent perspective. Um, it's um, right. It, it's uh, actually people of color usually like that perspective a lot more than the others because it suggests that at least someone is beginning to try to do something about the racism that exists in the society. Uh, it's, uh, it's intellectual, but it's a positive effort. The reason why one would want to evolve, if you will, to begin to develop other perspectives is because it still has the implicit message that whiteness is best. And so what the affirmative action programs try to do is to help people become more white, as opposed to recognizing that people have assets that society is using, they just don't take advantage of those. Uh, One of my favorites, for example, is... Um, a language that I do not understand is rap. I mean, they go 50 miles an hour and I don't understand. (laughs) But uh, today's college students, regardless of their race, are very good at that language. But that language does not show up in the SATs or the ACTs. Why not? That's That's a part of the culture. And so essentially we use cultures Without, without acknowledging that that's what we're doing and without rewarding people for our use of their, of their culture. So the pseudo-independent person uh, understands the racism is bad, but they don't understand yet why they should be advocating for inclusion of people as opposed to assimilation of people. Slight right. difference. Um, Inclusion meaning make, making space for the fullness and the uniqueness of that individual, as opposed to assimilation, which means you have to become more like white. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, as um, people be- develop the capacity to see things through pseudo-independent lenses, then uh, uh, they begin to interact more with people of color. 
often as they interact with people of color, they recognize that there are such things as um, uh, affiliation groups. So maybe the Black Engineers Association or the uh, Latinx uh, Nursing Association, uh, things that essentially are developed by people of color in minority status positions to say, hey, we're here and we want, we want to be acknowledged as well. Uh, as people begin to become aware of this, uh, when I'm doing uh, conversations with them, they will often ask, well, where are the white associations? I know. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard that, huh? <laughs> yes, I've definitely heard that. <laughs> so, of course, I will say <laughs> you, you, you all are white, are white associations. Uh, that's that's right. why we have these affiliation groups. But as they began to become aware that um, these affiliation groups exist, they began to ask questions about whiteness. And so I say to them, uh, I don't understand. Of course, I do. I don't understand why it is that you don't recognize that you are members of white groups all the time. And as they can hear that, they begin to develop the lens for exploring how whiteness works. Uh, how it works in the particular context in which they exist, and also how they are responsible for changing it in those contexts. Very often when something happens, we depend on the people of color to advocate for change. Yeah. When one is able to use the lenses that I call immersion, immersion lenses, the person is able to ask themselves, how are they responsible for ensuring that change happens how are they responsible for educating other people, other white people, about what's happening with respect to racism in those situations? Uh, hopefully, I would like people to use those lenses a whole lot, particularly when there are areas of stress in their environment because the tendency is to revert back to O strategies rather than staying within oneself and asking the question, how does this affect me and how can I change it? Um, the new strategies, yeah, immersion, yeah. insertion, yeah. Ultimately, what I hope happens is that people develop the capacity to use the lenses that I call autonomy. Um, and that's the lens that allows you to recognize that you can be a moral white person. You don't have to participate in white racism. Recognizing that you can uh, accept people who are not just like you, because if you if we were meant to just look in the mirror, then that's what we would do. We, there would just be one kind of person, but there are many kinds of people. And so if, when you can develop the capacity, not only to recognize and accept them, but to ensure that they are present in your environment, then you can use what I call the autonomous lens. So I'm going to tell you a secret now. Okay. Whenever I do conversations with white people, they say, uh, well, I'm using the autonomous lens all the time. Oh, boy. All right. So here's my secret. Okay. If, you're use, if you think you're using the autonomous lens all the time, you're probably not. Yes. Well, it's that's so cute because because that reminds me of, um, you know, from, again, the mindfulness standpoint, they say, if you see the Buddha on the side of the road, shoot him or kill him. <laughs> Meaning, you, do, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? I do indeed. Yeah. So it, it's so right. To your point, um, yeah, not so much. <laughs> right. Um, but that the autonomous lens is something that can be developed and cultivated over time if one keeps leaning in and keeps on doing the things that you just talked about in these other stages. And that it is, in fact, progressive. And that's what we call about, you know, in these Buddhist mindfulness you know, teachings, we talk about the middle way or the path or, you know, not too tight, not too loose, meaning that it's, it, it develops, it unfolds over time. And that this recovery or recentering back into our, you know, our deepest self, our original nature, our moral center, as you were saying, um, that, that that actually feels better, really doesn't it? I mean, isn't it really so much nicer to feel like we are not performing autonomy, but that we're autonomous in this way coming from a moral center. Exactly, that we are progressing towards autonomy. Um, and and as, as you're, we are progressing towards autonomy, recognize that 
racism wants to live. And so it's always changing. And so the reason one can say I am autonomous is because you always have to be questioning yourself about how you are reacting to racism as it exists today. Yes. I, I, I love what you're saying is racism wants to live and it's an always questioning, meaning that I think in this culture in general, and this is probably just part of whiteness culture in general, um, I've heard other people say, you know, part of the toxicity of, of this culture is the busyness and the always doing and, you know, that not that there isn't a place for effort and discipline and whatnot, but that this constant hum of busyness, but that this idea that, um, that, that, that it's a, that we're process, meaning that, that, you know, I've heard it say about, um, about, about marriages, um, you know, that, that the, pro, the point of marriage is growth, you know, the point of, of that is growth and that this is no different in that way. And that process, you know, evolves into the next iteration, that there's something new that wants to come. And that what I hear you saying is that that newness with our attention what we turn our attention to is what grows with our awareness and with our attention. If we bring our attention here, it can grow in a way that can become more anti-racist, more moral, more embodied, more connected. And if we don't actually intervene in that way, it's very likely that we will just continue with what would be sort of our default mode of being, you know, imprinted by this racist society and then continuing with whatever behaviors we do there, which are not as helpful. Yes, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, what I'm hoping people do is to give themselves permission to engage in the process. Yes, I mean, I, I think that that idea that it's a path, it's an unfolding. And I, I heard someone say, you know, you mentioned rap music. One of the terms that comes out, not in rap music necessarily, but in pop culture is being woke. Like, yeah. you know, you've heard that, right? I have. And, I, and, I, and that implies that there's like a state that one gets to where one is perhaps being woke and, you know, sort of idealized as anti-racist as opposed to what someone else said that I thought was so helpful, which was waking. Yeah, exactly. That's, I, I, I like that latter conceptualization better. Um, I probably say one is awakening. But then a part of awakening means one begins to take action. And part of the action is not just reflecting on oneself, but also learning how to change the context in which you exist so that uh, you don't have to keep awakening. Right, right. And and that leads me to sort of, you know, you're the psychologist, uh, you know, I'm sort of more on the side of the more social work piece, which... I'm sure they're, you know, very related. I know they are, but the bio, psycho, social, cultural, spiritual lenses and this ecological perspective, this person and environment, this idea of we are not, no man is an island and, um, and that it's this sort of false sense of separation and this longing for belonging that can so affect people who are white bodied in ways of neuroses and different other kinds of, you know, issues that, that present clinically that keep us from feeling connected and at ease and that this is actually good medicine for everyone. I think it's good medicine for everyone. I think it would be uh, unwise of me not to warn people that people don't always like to take their medicine. (laughs) <laughs> and so as one begins to awaken and try new things, one needs to be aware that uh, other white people might not accept you because you're challenging social norms. I think, though, that what will happen eventually is that if enough white people begin to challenge those social norms, then the, then this challenging will become the norm rather than the uh, uh, quote unquote, colorblindness that now seems to exist. Right, right. And that colorblindness being being that like, I don't see difference. I don't see color. I just accept everyone, which is sort of like that. I'm hearing false autonomy in a way that you're referencing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's more than just accepting everyone. Because in some ways, when you say I accept everyone, that means that you have the power to do that. Right, which goes back to privilege and power, um, which means that you, yeah, are in a, a certain 
you know, position that's been given access. Well, maybe that brings me to the next piece because we're talking about now policy, structural, bigger changes. We started with sort of the the more personal piece from the inside out. Now we're talking about the larger um, systems that are in place and have been for centuries. Um, and what's happening now in the streets with the protests? Um, can you talk a little bit about that and 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 what you're seeing and how this is similar or different from what you may have seen before in regard to you know more public declarations of um, people coming together to say this isn't right? Um, well, let let me start by saying that I don't think systems exist independently of the people. And so part of deconstructing a system means that the change begins on the individual level and then it rises to an interpersonal level and then it, it changes systems. Yes. So what is, what is not different about this system um, or what's happening in the streets now, people say it's, it's different because white people are involved. White people were actually involved in the uh, 1960s and before civil rights uh, activities. Um, they actually, many of them were killed because they were involved in those activities. So it's not different in that sense. What's different is that we now have a greater variety of peoples involved, not just in in the South, if you will, but all over the country. We have white people, we have ver- the various groups of color all saying that we want the system to change. But in fact, what's making the most difference for policymakers is that white people are involved in saying we want the system to change. And it's white young people who are involved. There are actually white young men who are involved in wanting the system to change. So in a sense, the, they are challenging their elders. They, they're saying, we want this policy to be different. I hope that they are there because they understand their personal responsibility and change for changing systems. But even if they don't understand it, I hope they stay there a long time because they are valued people. And so the system will change in response to their demands. Um, I think that it is uh, really beneficial that there are white people there, whatever their racial identity lenses might be. But historically, after uh, a while, they grow into mortgage holders and they leave the, the, the movement. And so I'm hoping that they won't leave this time, that this will be something that's uh, really long-term system changing. But I'm not greedy. While they're here, the system is beginning to make some small changes. Uh, I think it needs to make some major changes, but it only changes when the people demand it. And it really will only change when white people demand it because it's uh, white men primarily who control the system. Right. And what you're saying is that white men are now involved in, for example, the protests and they're, they're you know, younger and, and hopefully will stick with it over time. And I think it's so interesting when you look at systemic policies and you look at, you know, um, laws that, you know, were on the books where they would have prevented my parents from being married. Right. My father's black. My mother's white. You know, I mean, Italian, whatever we can, like we said, when she became white and when, you know, he is a Caribbean American, he is a Caribbean black person, right? Didn't, doesn't have the precise experience of um, a black American that was born here, right? Right. There's, but there's black. Well, depends on when he immigrated. He was 16. Um, and it was 19, hmm, I want to say 1960 something. 64. Yeah, something like the that. The Immigration Act. Okay. Yeah. And so I guess I guess my 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 point about that or what you were saying about white men being in power and being part of the change is that um you know there were laws against intermarriage, right? Yes, that that, there and, were. and and that as you say it goes from personal to interpersonal to then structural and systemic that part of the interpersonal piece is often love. Is often relationships. And right. that um, part of what is now happening is as there are just more people of color, black people, you know, in, you know, indigenous, Latinx, everything, um, there is more uh, what we would now call interracial marriage. And that there may be more of a felt sense of care 
honestly, for other communities because there's more of an opportunity to actually love who you love? Um, I hope so. <laughs> but I would also say that one of the advantages that there now being more people of uh, color is that now there are more of them also in the system. So even if they can't change it by themselves, they are there. And so they give a, a contrast to the stereotypes of people of color. So you can't say, you can't uh, say, for instance, that all uh, uh, black people, I'll use my group as an example, or violent criminals when you have black people that you see in Congress who are responsible adult human beings. So right. as we increase the number of people of color um, who are living contrary to the stereotypes of themselves, then we begin to generate that moral dilemma for, for white people. Why, in some ways, um, they can begin to ask some questions. Why do we have this belief system about them when if you look at them, you find that they are just like any other people uh, uh, in the society? Well, then what so it's a matter with, of, be, of having contact with people who are different from you. What happened then with Barack and Michelle Obama in the White House, President Obama? Was that not Say that? Again? What, 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 with with, with um, our 44th president, with President Barack Obama and, and Michelle Obama in the White House, was that not that? What happened with, with uh, them in the White House is that the reintegration in our society, the ordinary racism increased uh, incredibly. All of the white nationalist organizations uh, expanded. Uh, weapons, more weapons than ever were sold. Uh, the Congress vowed never to have to uh, pass any laws that Obama wanted. The uh, Senate stole his, his Supreme Court seat. So in effect, what happened when Obama uh, became president was they, the white heterosexual male system worked to try to take away any power that he had. And it's still working to try to take any way, away any power that he had. Fortunately, I think uh, uh, they were not entirely successful because he turned out to be smarter than they thought he would be. Mm. But they're still trying. Uh, fortunately, I think because they were who they are, the people in the society, a lot of people, I uh, respect and like them. And people who didn't even respect and like them, white people who didn't respect and like them when they were in office, now like them a lot more than they did before. So they were, they're there as a role model. But at the time, they were first and first often are not recognized for what they can bring to us. Mm, 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 right. Um, I have a couple more questions. One of them is um, back to sort of these uh, stages, if you will, because I, I know that we talked a little bit about um, how, we, how, how we invite people in, if you will, to even consider starting to do this work if we're, if we're talking about whiteness as we are. Um, and, and one of the questions that uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Natasha Stovall had, who's a clinical psychologist who actually wrote an article called Whiteness on the Couch, um, is uh, she wanted to know if you think that the um, WRID scale would be useful in therapy to bring people through the stages that you found in your research and have people tried it or written about it that you, that you know of or are aware of? Um, I don't know that people have written about the scale, particularly in their uh, clinical work. Certainly, there's lots of research that's used the uh, white racial identity uh, attitude scale. Um, I think it would be, I think it's useful to have people to begin to think about their issues in terms of the um, uh, schemas or statuses. Um, I think one of the activities actually in uh, race is a nice thing to have is kind of a easy way to get them to start thinking about that. Yeah, uh, uh, there are uh, some activities that allow them to assess themselves and figure out uh, where they are with respect to these statuses. Um, let me see, what else can I say about that? Well, yeah, 
I mean, that's, and, and this, and again, you have a new edition of this with the new publisher, but a, a race is a nice thing to have. It definitely helps locate where you are on that, on that, um, on that scale. And it's interesting because there's also parallel research in terms of other folks who are black identified and um, different stages of, of development there. I don't know if you want to, it's it's not your work, partic- I mean, it sort of is, but. Um, well, well, it is my work. I actually, I have actually have an identity model for everyone. Okay. Okay. So it is your work. Okay. I apologize. I'm, I, I, I'm more familiar with you in terms of the white racial stages of identity. And, and, and so please, can you talk a little bit about black racial stages of identity? Don't don't apologize. Actually, I'm I'm happy that you've identified me as being a person who does work on white racial identity for a long time. That was not a socially accepted thing to do. Mm. But yes, I I will talk about uh, people of color uh, racial identity, uh, which um, if you the way racism uh, works in our society is that the issue for White people is that they have internalized racism as privilege that they're entitled to. And their developmental task is to begin to relinquish that privilege. For people of color, they internalize uh, racism as deficits in themselves. And so the the task for them is to uh, recover from that internalized racism, to learn that they are valuable people in spite of what most of society thinks about themselves. And so I also have lenses by which that happens for people of color. Um, uh, conformity being the first lens where people of color just think, well, if I, if I am a, a model minority, if I do everything, if I talk right, if I walk right, if I dress right, then I will be accepted. And so they try to conform as much as possible to white culture, which is what all of the white ethnics have done. It's just that it doesn't work if you're a person of color because you have the marker. Uh, you have the designation that society uses to label you as belonging to one race. Sure. So um, conformity works probably on an interpersonal level sometimes. I think, for instance, that you can uh, get uh, positions of power if people think that you are conforming to the white norms. But regardless of whether you think or try to conform, sooner or later you discover that people are seeing you not as one of them, but as the token, perhaps, uh, in their in their in their setting. When that mm-hmm. happens, the person of color develops what I call a dissonance, so a confusion. They have tried to conform, so they don't really identify with their own group very much. They don't identify with the issues of their own group. But on the other hand, they now have messages that they are not members of the white group either. And so they're in confusion. Um, often when that happens, they begin to also search for who they are. Uh, what was um, their, their culture? What was their history? What have they given up in order to try to assimilate into the culture? And that's uh, immersion for them too. So that's a, a rejection essentially of white dominance and a beginning to search for who they can be. Um, that has uh, associated with it um, immersion. So they begin to reclaim their culture, their products. They recognize that they built the White House, for instance. And so they begin to say, well, why isn't anyone acknowledging the contributions that we actually made to building the country? So they begin to reclaim themselves. They use their anger to energize uh, change. Uh, ultimately, I also hope for them that they are able to develop um, uh, Integrative awareness, uh, which is essentially the capacity to be who they are in a society that doesn't uh, acknowledge who they are, but also the capacity to to recognize the complexities of who they are. There are many ways to be a person of color. There are many different kinds of white people. And so as they begin to get that kind of awareness, they're beginning able to form coalitions and build relationships uh, across different uh, dimensions. And as you say that, just um, one of the words that comes to mind that Kimberly Crenshaw has used is intersectionality. And, and that may be not the same exact thing as you're talking about, but just that we hold multiple identities simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kimberly actually talks about it uh, more from the outside. And I talk about it more from the inside, but it's essentially the same kind of concept. Okay. 
And then beyond that is the next stage. Well, that that's that's the ultimate stage. Before that's that, ultimate. of course, is it uh, internalization, which is a. Uh, uh, Essentially, a beginning to intellectually deal with the issues of one's one's racial uh, and et- ethnic group. I actually use a uh, racialized ethnic group, which is um, recognition that some of the groups that we think about as uh, racial groups are not actually racial groups, but we treat them as if they are. For instance, the Latinx people have every kind of race you can imagine, but we treat the uh, Latin X as a racial group. So when I say racialized ethnic groups, that's essentially what I mean. Right. So as um, people begin to think about uh, their history, begin to kind of begin to monitor the how they are going to use their emotional energies, begin to have an intellectual understanding of what's happened to them and what what needs to happen then that's essentially what I mean by internalization. You still focus more on one's own group, but now it's focused on one's group own group from um, more of a, a cognitive intellectual capacity to think about the issues as opposed to reacting more strongly out of uh, emotion. Mm. Which is also part of the whole path of mindfulness in a way that we sort of become aware. And from that place, um, and, and, and again, some sort of neurophysiology, you know, we recognize our fight, flight, freeze response, our reactivity, which is sort of that maybe first racist impulse, if you will. And then um, we begin to recognize the limbic sort of meanings and associations and our subcortical sort of, you know, limbic brain. And then we have this executive functioning piece that can come online and make uh, better choices and better decisions. And so we can use our left brain, if you will, that more analytical side in service to really that heart center that's connected to the mind, heart, and body um, that can help us move toward that, you know, collective um, connection and and, and, and embodiment and and liberation. Um, Is there something that you wanted to say there? Uh, no, I agree with you. That okay. seems to, <laughs> seems okay, to be a perfect fit. Okay, um, and then and then just a couple things before we close, and then um, we'll 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 end because I I so appreciate your time. I could talk to you forever. Um, shame, fear, and hate. These are three words that have been coming up for me a lot lately. Um, in terms of just thinking about what's keeping people from being able to get to these, you know, sort of stages of actualization. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about sort of what comes up for you, even as I just say them? Um, For white people, perhaps shame, perhaps fear. Who's who's fearing? What are we, you know, fear, I think, is the predecessor perhaps toward the hate. I don't know. What are white people afraid of and, 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 and ashamed of? I don't know. uh, Fear, fear of loss of privilege. Uh, fear that one will, uh, it's, it's, uh, fear is an interesting thing for white people. Uh, f- fear that, um, in some ways one will be blamed for what happens. Uh, fear that if, uh, everyone is treated as if they are equal, that means in some ways you will lose something. Um, I, for instance, often talk about my, uh, with my students in one of my race seminars, white students in my race seminars, about what would happen if they decided that everyone was entitled to equal education. And so instead of sending their children to schools in the suburbs, they sent their children to schools in the city. Um, they will respond to that with fear because that means that they are giving up the privilege of their children deserving a better education than the children who live in the in the city. So it's fear of loss. It's a uh, it's a uh, fear that you are not protecting the resources that you were granted. It's fear that in some way, if someone gets an an advantage, that means you get a disadvantage. Um, shame. Um, I don't hear that one so much. Can Have you heard it in a particular context? Well, I've heard it because I was in a trauma conference the other day and I, to be honest, can't remember her name. I think it was, last name was Dr. Hall, but I, I can't recall. And she was a, a, a black clinical psychologist who'd worked in the trauma he- field for a very long time and had done diversity and inclusion work before clinical work and was saying that I wish I really understood shame and white shame, um, you know, better 
uh, as a way that I could help unlock um, what's helping to block uh, people who are white-bodied from moving into a place of, of, of greater self-understanding and, and, and more um, connection with, um, you know, black and brown brothers and sisters. So that's... I, 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 yeah, I've never heard shame. I've heard uh, fragility in the sense that D'Angelo uses it. Um, the belief that uh, uh, the person just can't tolerate hearing these awful things about white people. And so... Uh, it, hearing these awful things about white people feels like white people blame. And so in many cases that results in, um, depending on the gender, in uh, tears because one is being mistreated. It re- uh, results in anger, usually from men, because they feel like they're being blamed. And, and actually they are. Um, blamed or uh, being held accountable or both, right? It, 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 exactly. But either of those are ways to not deal with the core issue. Uh, if your feelings are hurt, the inclination of most people is to try to help you resolve your hurt feelings. If you're angry, the inclination of most people is either to be afraid of you or to try to uh, uh, calm down your anger. Either of those reactions means that you're not dealing with the issue that generated those, those feelings. Right. And so they're self-protective strategies. Right. And I I think that's so fascinating when we look at the human psyche that um, I I, I sort of was um, theorizing that I I was thinking of shame as as the moral injury argument, meaning that white fragility was sort of, you know, protective in a way because it could, you felt bad. So you felt bad about feeling bad, but then you also were so self-absorbed that you weren't actually taking compassionate action and decisive action in terms of moving toward either digging into the deeper things that we talked about earlier about your own history or toward, you know, the collective experience in a structural way or something. Uh, yeah. For white fragility is you are feeling, you are feeling bad, but you're feeling bad for yourself. You're not feeling because you're in this situation as opposed to feeling bad about the wrongs that you began discussing originally. Right, right. And and that is just a self-absorbed and in some ways an internal narcissism, if you will, which when I say to people who have that, they're like, what? Um, I'm not grandiose or narcissistic. And I'm like, well, but you're focusing and centering your own emotions here as opposed to what just happened. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is also white privilege. Right, meaning I get to feel bad and be centered and have people coddle my feelings because that's what happens when I'm in a privileged position as opposed to the person of color, for example, who's at the boardroom table who just had the microaggression against them and doesn't get attended to because now we're worried about, I don't know, Mary Jane because she's crying. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think that that's part of what I think when we start to do this work, people are beginning to maybe try to string together the pieces when, when um, and again, not monolithic, but I'll just say, you know, when many experiences of many Black people have been in, for example, in situations where that happens again and again and again and again and again, and they say, you know, sort of death by a thousand paper cuts, these microaggressions, that it becomes oppressive. And then, of course, it's most obvious when we look at what's happening with, you know, George Floyd and with Breonna Taylor and happening in the streets on a systemic level, but that at this interpersonal level, at this personal level, that it does take a toll and it's heavy. It's heavy on one's heart and it's heavy in one's ability to kind of move through. I think that that is exactly true. When you have to take responsibility for the society's injustices um, and they are happening every day in your life, then sooner or later there's a buildup and in some way or another, you have to get out of it. You have to remove yourself from that situation, or you should, if you can. Yeah. And 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 your final words, maybe on one small step, or your hope, or you know, um, you know, it's been said that you know, love justice is what love looks like in public. Um, it's also been said that um, you know we have to change ourselves in order to be able to change the world. It's also been said that none of us are free unless we all are free. Um, any, any sort of, it's also been said that, um, you know, equality to you, uh, you know, uh, is, feel, feels like oppression or something, you know, like to a person who in a position of privilege, um, meaning like to your point about what, you know, what you might give up if you're, 
if you're in a position of privilege. You know, I've heard these things. Do you have hope? What, where, what, what, what would you say to folks? Uh, well, I obviously have hope. I wrote the book, which was intended <laughs> to give white people hope. Um, but I would say that growth doesn't happen without pain. And so if you are expecting to be a better person or make the world a better place, then you have to anticipate that you will feel some personal pain as a result of of your goal. But if you're successful, then ultimately we'll live in the kind of society and be the kind of people that we want to be. Beautiful. Dr. Helms, I, I, I love that. And, and you did, in fact, write the book, many of them. And I'm so um, blessed uh, to have read A Race is a Nice Thing to Have, which is um, a new, has a new cover and a new edition, as well as some of the um, books more for, for clinicians like Black and White Racial Identity. But of course, um, you know, anyone can, can, can get these and, and really do the work. So I just really want to say it's been a privilege, a privilege, and I use that word correctly here <laughs> in a way it's really been my honor and my my privilege and my joy to 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 welcome you and and I um am grateful for you really taking the time to sort of stumble around with me with my um continued learning process on this path and and appreciate all of your dedication to this work well thank you i appreciate having this opportunity i always learn something by um, having conversations with people and so i appreciate having the conversation with you francesca Thank you, Dr. Helms. Take good care. You too.